point. If you're happy in the Lord, say amen. Amen. My text this morning, and, and this is this is on the spur of the moment. I had something put together to work on for a few months. And last Sunday, uh, Nathan's message kind of sparked something new, and that went out the window. So I've only worked on it just a few days, but if you're in the habit of turning in your Bible, my text is coming from Jeremiah 5.24 and Revelation 14.15. Jeremiah 5.24 Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain both the former and the latter. In his season he reserves into us the appointed feast of the harvest. Revelation 14, 15. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to hear him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come to breathe for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. When I was growing up, one of the most profound things that I remember is each year, my parents and all the neighbors would go out and sow their crops. Now there's going to be some of you in here that don't understand what I'm saying, or understand what I'm referring to. But there's a terminology in farming called new ground. And it's basically ground that's never been planted, never had anything sown up into harvest. But farmers also know that you cultivate and you rotate. You build that ground new and you sow it and you use it. And then you leave it dormant and go to a new ground and turn new ground but you can always come back to that. That's what we do in our Christian walks. We plant seeds in our generations. And some of our generations are new. But no matter whether the generation is new or they're seasoned, they're older, 30, 40, 50 years old, the seed of salvation can be planted. And when that seed of salvation is planted, it's just like the seeds of our ground. It grows, cultivated, watered, nourished. And the nourishment comes from Christian walk, Christian life, walking in the path of Jesus Christ. And remember what a Christian walk is. And that is to go out in our communities, in our jobs, in our everyday walk with Christ, and that is to sow seeds, that those seeds can grow and break someone close to the harvest time. Amen. And I'm going to read a poem that puts it in perspective. I'm going to try to read it, let's put it that way. The shaft is being sorted the harvest time is here. The end of time is coming. The rapture day is near. Yeah. We are heirs to his kingdom. Take time to have a look. The day of his arrival is written. <coughs> the wheat is turned together. The shepherd comes to reap. The grain is being gathered. He comes to claim his sheep. Stand up and look around you. The signs are every word. The day of his arrival was spread throughout the air. <clears throat> the sun is softly setting. Feel the shifting of the breeze. The fields are turning golden. 
hear the rustling of the tree. Look to the skies for Jesus. All things will be made new. Your toil on earth is finished. He's coming back for you. Put down that plow and chisel. There is no need to fear. Stand up and look around you. The harvest time is near to you. We're in our last days. Yeah. And when they give of the harvest, they give her the good. And they put it away. If you're a Christian, you love God, and you know Jesus died on the cross for us, he will harvest the good. And our storehouse will be in heaven. Praise God. We'll step across and we'll see an everlasting life for eternity. As the man come forward, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for letting me take out what I received in. And let you remember each and every day of life is giving. And that's giving back to you. Bringing someone close to you, bringing them into the house of the Lord, that they can hear the word and follow you. Just thank you for our church, be with the message of the messenger this morning, be with the offering, that it be with the uplifting of my kingdom. Just thank you for all the prayers that are answered. Just thank you for the blessings that bestowed on us each and every day. Just thank you for everything that you do for us. Dying on the cross and shedding your blood. Thank you for praying in thy name. Amen.
After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. For He hath judged the great war which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and the twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen and Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and all ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I want to stop there. Lord, we love you. Help us this morning, I pray. We'll give you the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me get my composure for me. Please. <laughs> I just love how the Lord ties it all in together. He knows what He's doing. Amen. Amen. If we just get a hold of that, then God knows what He's doing. Praise the Lord. I want to preach on hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I'm going to get right into the message this morning. In verse number 1, we see salvation of the Lamb. It says, and after these things I heard a great voice from much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, or Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power in the Lord our God. Here are a great multitude of people from every kindred tongue and nation, a vast multitude that no man other than the Lord can number. And they're all praising God, saying, Hallelujah, and Amen. The Bible says that the four and twenty elders are there. And they're falling before the, the before God, praising the Lord and worship Him. Six times, you know, six times in the book of Revelation, we see these twenty-four elders. They're mentioned in chapter four, verse ten. They're mentioned in chapter five, verse eight, and verse fourteen. They're mentioned in chapter seven, verse eleven. They're mentioned in chapter eleven, verse sixteen. And they're mentioned in chapter 19, verse 4. All six times when the 24 elders are mentioned, which are a picture of the redeemed, and that's one picture of them, they're praising the Lord, giving glory and honor, and worship Him for He alone is, uh, is worthy. And so they're praising Him for worship, or for salvation, for His glory, for His honor, and for His power. And then they're, they're praising Him for His sentence, Verse 2 and 3, the Bible says, For true and righteous are His judgment. For He hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. I began to think, you know, several of us have been concerned. Brother Aaron and I talked last weekend. Brother Mike mentioned two or three Wednesdays ago, we're concerned about the school system and, and, and what's being forced on our kids. And, and uh, I, I know there's a lot of debate and I know there's a lot of question and I don't want to touch on all that this morning because I'm going to save that for another message that God's dealing with me about. I do want to say that uh, this is one thing, Brother Aaron, that I haven't been able to get off my heart all week long. When you turn on the news, you see this, the war on terror. I mean, ever since 9-11, there's been a war against terror. Against Muslims, jihad, Islam, 
the away. And I preach some of the historical things, Sister Nate, from Middle Eastern practices. But God showed me some new things over the last couple of weeks. Now I'm going to talk about the bride, and I'm going to talk about the groom. Now there is, there is what's called the betrothal stage. Here at this betrothal stage, do you remember when Mary and Joseph, they, they'd already uh, been said that they would be married at betrothal. It's even more than engagement, even though they're not living under the same roof, and even though they're not dwelling together and sleeping in the same bed. Betrothal in Middle Eastern times and in over there in that society, I mean, it's already been chosen in the sight of both families. They're as good as fairy. That's, that's how to be scared about this 
Then there's the presentation stage. So scripture that is in reference to this would be Matthew 22, verse 1 through 12. Talk about the marriage that's taken place and some laughing and some not wanting to go and some not making preparation. And the king says, go out into the highways and the hedges, get them all, bring them in. One passage of scripture says, that the house may be full. And the Bible says, around verse 11 and 12, that somebody is at the marriage and they don't have their marriage, their wedding garment on. And you know what? The king separates them. He's not ready for the marriage supper. Send them on their way. There's going to be many when Jesus comes that's not going to be ready. They're, they're not going to have the wedding garment on. Now, I got to study and I, got, I found this out. That when a female in the Middle East gets her dress ready, it's two pieces. It's the tunic is the inner part and the tongue is what we call is on the outer part. And the, the, the bride can make it as elaborate as she wants. I mean, it can have all the thrills and have all the whistles and I have a train that's 300 yards long, whatever. Or it can be as elaborate or it can be as simple as she wants it to be. Now, I may be speculating a little bit and I, I know I spiritualize a whole lot of things, but I want you to think about something because it's, it's worth at least thinking about. If you're the bride of Christ and we're supposed to have our wedding garments on and, and, and be ready for that come, I'm going to tell you about how you live your life for Jesus. How you live your life on earth. You can have it as simple as if you want it to be or as elaborate that you want it to be. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 10 and on says that every one of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That every one of us is going to be judged. Every one of us is going to give account for the things we've done in our lives. Now the Bible says over there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. I want to show you some. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. If you're following along in your Bibles. But the Bible says in verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if a man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if you listen, there's the great white throne judgment. That's where the laws will appear. Then there's the judgment seat. Christ. That's where the saved will appear. And the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with your salvation, but it has to do with what you've done for the Lord in your body, in word, in deed, in action. And I'm going to tell you, you can receive crowns, you can receive rewards, or you can have a loss stripped away. So if you want to have a wedding gown, a wedding garment that is arrayed and rewards from God, then live your life for Him. And do all you can for Him. Amen. I mean, I thought I'd get a few more amens than that. I mean, don't you want to be something for God? And do something for God? Hey, if you want to have a simple garment, have a simple garment. If you don't want no rewards, don't get no rewards. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do all I can for Jesus in my life. For the Lord. So, the wedding's coming. The wife has made herself ready. There's the betrothal stage. There's the presentation stage. The groom goes and gets the bride, and there is one day the rapture is going to take place. Now, what, what happens is when the bride is presented to the groom, she's got a veil on her face. Sister Amy, they don't know who the bride is. Only the groom knows. And the father knows. And they come back, and I guess families and servants, but the city doesn't know. They're getting ready to be called out to a celebration here in a few days. For seven days, that bride and that groom consummate the marriage. They fellowship with one another, love one another, get to know one another. And then, after seven days, the marriage celebration is going to take place. That groom and that bride, they come back before everybody. And she doesn't have a veil about her face. Everybody knows who the bride is. Well, one day, the groom's coming back for the bride. And you know, uh, they're coming out 
bacon, we're going to have a bell about our face. For seven years, we're going to be up in heaven, worshiping Him and having a big old time with the saints of God that's been on before us. He said, Preacher, who all is up there? We've well, got the patriarchs of old that look to Jesus all the way up to Jesus down on the cross of Calvary and, and before Pentecost. And then you got all those that live for Jesus after the day of Pentecost and live for Him all the way to the day up to the rapture. Hey, they're going to be there. John R. is there. Toots is up there. Todd's up there. Tony's up there. Papa's there. Mamma and Papa's there. I'm telling you, all the saints of God that put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus will be up there. And for seven years, we're going to have a big old time. And after seven years, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back on a wild horse. And that we're going to come back with Him. Oh, we're going to be taken up. We're going to have a veil about our face. But one day, every eye is going to behold Him. Everybody's going to know who He is. Every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And we're going to come back. And Jesus is going to body slam the devil. And He's going to bind Him up for a thousand years. And we're going to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years during the millennial reign. Praise God. We're going to have a marriage celebration like we ain't never been to. You know, you take a royal party. You take a prince and a princess and you put them. I can't even think of uh, Prince Charles' son and his uh, daughter-in-law. I, I don't even, I can't even remember who the name Kate, I think is one of them. And uh, anyways, they, you know, when they got married, it was millions was viewing on the television because that was a royal wedding. Hey, I'm going to Sisterly, that's a royal wedding. I mean, praise the good Lord. He's the King of glory. And the Bible says that we're going to be made princes and princesses. I'm telling you what, hallelujah, it might not be on NBC. It might not be viewed by Tim Brokaw or whatever his name is. But hallelujah, what a marriage it's going to be. Monday to preach this. <laughs> Glory, I get excited because I know, I know that before we sing another song, Jesus can come back. <laughs> well, here at the Petroleum stage, the presentation stage, and the festival stage. Now, we know who the guests are going to be. And I've got a hold of this. Now, I found this out, Brother Jack. Let me find the scripture first. I think it's, it's in Luke 12, Luke 12, 36 to 37. I didn't write it down, but I'm in the vicinity. Luke 12, 37, I believe. I found this out. I didn't know this before. But Sister Patsy. After the wedding, at the celebration, it's the groom's duty to go and check on all the guests and make sure they got everything that they need. I didn't know that. The groom does it. Luke 12, 36. Thank <laughs> you. 
might go down to the where's that place we like? Cheesecake. Yeah. <laughs> and we might eat ten pieces of cheese. And because I got like 40 kinds. And that, that waitress may come back to the and say, is there anything yet I can get you? Y'all might say I'd like to be filling coffee. Or I'd like to send a piece of that cheesecake or something like that. Brother Jack, just saying, everything that we've preached for,
sister Caitlin, I'm going to obey the Lord. Would you come up here? God's been a miracle in her life. I love to hear this young lady pray. And I believe it would be alright. I believe it would be fit and God put it on my heart. Will you kiss me a in prayer? I love it. Yes. 